So one of my favorite breakfasts in the entire world is a large bowl of miso soup with broccoli added to it. It just gives me energy all day. It's super healthy. It doesn't have a huge amount of calories. It's really great. What exactly is miso soup? In its simplest form, it's four ingredients. Dashi, wakame seaweed, there's some other type of seaweed, but it's typically wakame, tofu, and of course, miso paste. Miso soup has been around in its current incarnation for a very long time. We're talking 13th century, like 1200? That's a long time. And before that, you have ancestors of miso soup that you probably wouldn't quite recognize in miso soup, but clearly led up to what current day miso soup is. Miso soup is incredibly ubiquitous in Japanese cuisine. Nearly every single meal you have in Japan starts off with a bowl of miso soup. It's so ubiquitous during the two Japanese civil wars, miso soup was the soldiers' field rations. It's just not a meal unless you have miso soup in Japan. Let's talk a little bit about dashi, which is the iconic Japanese seafood and seaweed stock. In its most basic form, it is bonito, which is a type of fish, which is dried and pressed and then turned into little shavings and flakes, and kombu seaweed. You take some water, you put the kombu in it, you bring it to a simmer over a very low heat, like maybe medium low. Before it even starts to shimmer and simmer, you take it off the heat, you add the bonito flakes, you let it steep for 5-10 eh, minutes, then you strain it and you have dashi. Historically, what people would do is they would buy a big block of bonito. It would be pressed and all the bones and, and skin would be removed. It's just the bonito fillets compressed into a really hard block. And I mean hard, hard, like harder than most would. Bonito is a very, very tough fish. So they would take that and then they would shave it themselves at home. And the shaver looked like... Um, have you ever watched a wood channel on YouTube, you know, where they make stuff out of wood? There's a thing called a plane, and if you see them doing it, they'll take a piece of wood, and they'll take this thing and kind of go and put it on there, and what it does is it's got a little razor on the bottom, and it flattens the wood out, and as they're doing it, you can watch little shavings of wood come out. That's sort of what a bonito shaver looked like turned upside down. You had this big wooden thing and you had a little like razor coming out and you would shave the bonito on top of that and make your own bonito flakes. Nobody does that anymore unless you're a hardcore foodie or you work in a restaurant or the older people do because that's what they used to, that's what it was when they were growing up. Everybody now buys flaked bonito pre-flaked in the store. However, less people do that they typically use what's called hondashi, and hondashi is instant dashi. Now, there are some things that the Japanese nail. Hondashi is one of them. It, it doesn't taste as good as homemade dashi, but it is 85 to 90% there. It is so close it doesn't make a difference, which is why everybody in Japan uses it. This is very much opposed to the instant stocks we have here in the West, which are garbage. They're absolutely awful. They're overly salty. They taste like crap. They're just junk. Dashi has a very interesting history, and it's really married, of course, with the history of Japan. We find traces of dashi in the 8th century. We also find precursors of dashi, and precursors of dashi date back many thousands of years. So what were the precursors of dashi? Well, they would take a fish and they would poach it in water that had some seaweed for flavoring. Hundreds of years later, they turn it into this thing that is ubiquitous to Japanese cuisine. You can't make Japanese without dashi. Now, dashi is really, really weird and very, very unique. It's, it's a strange, strange thing. The fairly modern incarnation of dashi, you could trace back to the 13th century. However, the truly modern dashi really got started around the 1600s. Now, this is an extremely interesting part of Japanese history because that is just post their first civil war when they went into over 200 years of nearly complete isolation. They didn't allow anyone in and they didn't allow any of their people out. Now, there were some exceptions. There was a single port that would do pretty extensive trade with China and, interestingly, a couple of Dutch ships as well. The sailors weren't allowed to interact with anybody outside of the port, so the foreigners who were doing trade, the Chinese and the Dutch, were not allowed to interact with anyone else except at the port, and they weren't allowed to visit any people on the continent. So really, every single person on the island of Japan was, for 200 years, just allowed to develop with 
no influence whatsoever. And dashi is this weird, weird thing. It is not the same as stocks you see all across the world. For the most part, most stocks are very similar across cultures. It contains meat, it contains bones, it contains some vegetables and some herbs for flavoring. And they work pretty much the same way. And dashi is just not that way. Dashi is this weird freakish thing that really developed in its modern form in this isolated period when Japan was uninfluenced by any other nations and basically just was allowed to develop to get its freak on. And they did from a culinary standpoint. The great chef Eric Repair calls dashi beautifully perfumed water. And it's probably a little strong, but it's close. Dashi is marvelous and it's super subtle and very, very interesting. The next ingredient is miso paste, and miso paste has a very interesting history of its own. Modern miso paste we can trace back to the 13th century, but before that, what allowed Japan to do that was an imported Chinese treat that was basically fermented soybeans, kind of pressed together in a block, put on a stick, and was lit like a popsicle. It was, a, it was legitimately a treat. And this evolved into what is currently miso paste. What is miso paste? Miso paste is really interesting. There are several types of miso paste, but the two main ones sort of would be red and white. Red is fermented longer and has a more aggressive flavor, and white is fermented less and has a much more subtle sweet flavor. What you do is you take soybeans and you take a little bit of rice or some other type of grain, and then you take a culture. And it's a very specific, special culture. If you go to a Japanese store, you can buy it. And you take that culture and you put it in there and you mix it up and then you clamp the lid on and you let it sit for a very long time, weeks and weeks and weeks. And what it does is it ferments. The rice helps the culture start to ferment, the soybeans ferment, and it just becomes this wonderful, beautiful living thing. I mean, miso has actual living enzymes in it, which is why, interestingly, in miso soup, you are not supposed to boil the miso because it's thought that you are boiling away a bunch of the healthiness. Now, there's other recipes where you certainly add it to sauces that cook on the stove and things, but that's just for miso soup. That's the pretty standard protocol. So the next ingredient is wakame seaweed. Wakame seaweed goes way, way, way back. We're talking 5,000 years ago. Archaeologists have found clay pots that had wakame seaweed in it that were eaten. This goes so far back. And wakame is a really interesting seaweed. It's obviously farmed now, but it's a very, very super hardy seaweed. It is really easy to grow. In fact, it's problematic. You have a bunch of countries who have listed wakame seaweed as an invasive species because it's killing out native seaweed and kind of screwing up the whole ecosystem in their oceans. It's very interesting. Why is this so important and why were they eating it so long ago? It is one of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. It has a ton of vitamin and minerals. Okay. It can be problematic as well if you eat too much. For example, a single small serving of wakame seaweed, which is going to be rehydrated, would be about a half a cup, maybe two-thirds of a cup. That would contain almost 300% of your recommended daily iodine. If you eat a lot of wakame seaweed, it could be a problem. You could have too much iodine. So it's not a huge deal, but just be aware. In fact, here's a little interesting fact about wakame. In the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, you would be able to pay your taxes in Japan in seaweed. You'd give it to whoever the royal was that was taxing your area of the country, and you'd be able to pay your taxes in wakame, because it was just so ubiquitous. So wakame is typically dry, and you put it in water and rehydrate. It rehydrates in five to seven minutes. It's very quick. Uh, it has a really, really amazing, super silky mouthfeel. It's really delightful. It's absolutely fantastic. That's another ingredient that really, when you taste it, say, oh, this is Japanese. Just fantastic. And of course, the last ingredient is tofu. I'm not going to get too far into tofu now because I'm planning on doing an entire video on the history of tofu. It has come such a long way in the last 20 years. There's really super high quality tofu available. And you look back 30 years ago and the tofu that was available in Northern America was garbage. And now it's fantastic. Whole Foods in particular, the 365 brand, is absolutely marvelous. I'm a huge fan of it. It has a great mouthfeel. It's not gritty. It has a really good flavor. It's super fresh and it's reasonably priced. You should check it out. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make my all-time favorite breakfast, miso soup with broccoli. So let's go cook it and try it out.
Let's start with one and a half cup broccoli florets, six ounces firm tofu cut into one half inch cubes, one and a half tablespoons kome seaweed, one third to one quarter cup white miso paste. First, let's rehydrate the kome. Just add a decent amount of water and set it aside for a few minutes. This is hondashi. We're going to want two teaspoons for three cups of water. Each hondashi is a little bit different, so follow the instructions for how much to use. Let's add that to three cups of water. Give it a stir to make sure that it's well mixed in. And add the broccoli to the pot. While the broccoli is cooking for one minute, we're going to take our miso paste and add a little bit of hot dashi. Just a couple of tablespoons at a time. First we add two tablespoons and then we'll give it a good mix until it's a thick paste and then we're going to add a couple more tablespoons and keep doing that until we have a nice smooth slurry. Sometimes people will take the miso paste and put it in a small handheld strainer and put that directly in the soup and mash it in with a spoon. I find this gets a little bit better results, but you can do whichever one you want. Just give this a good stir until there aren't any lumps and it's a nice smooth slurry. It's been about a minute. Now let's add the tofu. We don't need to cook the tofu, we just want to heat it through. So we'll put this in and let this cook for 15 seconds. Let's remove the water from the kome. We're just going to drain the water, then take the kome in your hand and squeeze it as hard as you can. It's okay, you're not going to hurt it. It's very hearty. Let's add the kome seaweed to the soup. Again, it doesn't have to cook, it just has to heat through. Remove this from the heat and add the miso paste. Just put it all in. Give it a nice stir and you're ready to serve. It's as simple as that. One steaming hot bowl of miso soup. Let's take these ingredients one by one. Start with the broccoli. Mm, it smells, of course, like broccoli, but it has that, it just has that sort of really light and dashi and miso perfume on it. That's really wonderful. I really should work up a recipe with those. Mm, the broccoli is perfectly cooked. Really, for florets this size, like a minute and a half tops is perfect. Let's try some of the wakambe. Mm. You know, wakambe has such a delightful mouthfeel. It's got a really soft, super silky feel. It's just so delightful. So this tofu that I'm using is Whole Foods 365 tofu. It is absolutely marvelous. Mm. It is really a marvelous tofu. It's some of the best on the market. I would really recommend seeking out if you can. It's reasonably priced and it's absolutely great. It just tastes fantastic and has a really marvelous mouthfeel. I think you should really try it if you can. Okay, let's have some of the soup. Man, that's great. It's got a really, really soft subtleness about it. Just a kind of perfume of the sea. It's so fantastic. You should really try this. If you like a little bit more assertive taste, absolutely try a red miso paste. That really would give it a much more 
Mm. Um, this this one with the white miso paste is very subtle and sweet and just oh, so nice. It's, it's really fantastic. I also make a version of this that is much more hearty, has noodles and a bunch of other things, and I'll probably do another video on that one because that one is much closer to a kind of a mix between miso soup and ramen. I'll do a video on that later for sure. But this one for breakfast, you really should try it. It's absolutely great, super healthy, it doesn't have a huge amount of calories, and and you'll feel energized for the rest of the morning. Hey, listen, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Click that subscribe button and click the notification bell so you don't miss a video. Listen, thanks for watching again. I do appreciate it. And take care of yourself. Stay safe.